of the Mississaugas of New Credit and on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are extremely grateful to work in the community. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors and supporters who make everything TIFF does possible. Our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, and our major industry supporters, Ontario Creates and Telefilm Canada. Now, before we get started, just a reminder, there's no professional photography or video recording inside the studio. We are live streaming the conference, so hello to our online audiences. And uh, if you please do take notes and feel free to tweet using the hashtag TIFF18. And let's connect online as well. So welcome to Canada, welcome to Toronto. For those of you who are visiting and those of you who live here, you know that Toronto is a hub for filmmakers and film lovers. But it is also one of the leading tech hubs in the world and many innovative companies and talents in big tech have even been homegrown or are based here. So this is why we've launched the newest industry programming stream, TIFF Tech, focusing on the business and innovations in, of computer technology. So just to give you a little snapshot of some of our programming, so yesterday we had a great uh, chat um, with Aaron Burry uh, talking about the uh, startup business and putting, uh, applying becoming an entrepreneur using the entrepreneurial mindset and applying that to producing and to the creative industries. So do check that out online if you haven't, if you missed yesterday's session. Uh, at 4.15 in conference room B, we've got TIFF Tech top of the news feed. So we've gathered the sharpest minds in various tech sectors to discuss trends, ethics, intersections, and impacts of technology in our lives. Speakers include Inmar Givoni, she works at Uber in developing AI technology for autonomous vehicles. We've got creator and tech journalist Ramona Pringle, who's also the director of the brand new 110 Bond Creative Innovation Accelerator at Ryerson. And Nathaniel Barr, he's, a crea he's the professor of creative and cr creativity and creative thinking at Sheridan College and an expert in, cognition, in human cognition. And it is hosted by Elamine Abdel Mahmoud from BuzzFeed News. So that's gonna be a really fun, cool top, uh, conversation happening at 4.15. Do arrive early. But this morning session kicks us right off here. Uh, it, we explore the ideas and technological uh, evolution of decentralization, namely blockchain's part of that, and from the perspectives of technology investors and strategists. Our two guest speakers have very different and unique backgrounds. First, you will hear from Prashant Mata. Prashant is a Toronto-based venture capitalist. He invests in early stage technology startups across sectors including blockchain, digital media, consumer applications, and business-to-business -business software. Prashant previously worked at Omer's Ventures, Samsung, and Deloitte, and he is regarded as one of the most active investors in the Canadian tech industry. He's also been my collaborator in creating TIFF Tech, so just a big thank you to him for all of his efforts and insights. Prashant will present a brief overview and then we'll be joined on stage by Stephen Haft. Uh, Stephen is a tech investor and advisor in media and blockchain. Most, he's, he's got a very diverse background here. Uh, most recently served as the Senior Vice President of Innovation at Time Inc. Was previously the Chief Strategy Officer at AOL's $1.2 billion interactive marketing group. He's been a social impact activist he, he's a co-founder of Earth Day. He's on the board of directors at the, of the Blockchain Social Impact Coalition. And he also happens to be an award-winning producer of Dead Poet Society and Emma. So, like I said, two guests with very diverse backgrounds, but we're here to talk about decentralization, so we like to shake things up. So to start off our day, let's please welcome to the stage Prashant Mata. Thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, very, very honored to be here and look forward to having a great conversation with all of you. Um, so I'll start by my first question. How many folks in the audience know what this is? All right, we can jump right to Q&A. <laughs> um, Satoshi Nakamoto. So for those of you that don't know who this individual is, creator of Bitcoin. Now, what's interesting is we don't know if this individual is man, woman, child, or an alien machine. No one knows. But what's exciting is, to me, this is a movement. It's a technology revolution. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
So I'll start with why this matters. You know, while, while I love how cryptocurrencies have gone mainstream over the last couple of years, you know, I often feel that people or investors in the community overlook what's the underlying innovation. And, you know, I'm excited of what's happening in the crypto and tokenization and all of the initial coin offerings that you've probably heard of. But today we're going to focus and have a conversation about blockchain technology and what it means to the world. But why? Why does this even matter? Who cares? Everyone should, because decade after decade, we have seen unprecedented cycles of innovation. From early days of the internet to mobile, cloud, and social today, we've seen technology touch every aspect of human life. And we just may be at another inflection point. Well, I'll start off by saying that blockchain is not going to solve the world problems, um, although it could have prevented Trump from getting elected, but that's a topic for another day. Um, my hope is that this technology will enable a decentralized world and give power back to the people. What is this chart? Anyone can tell me? Take a guess, please. That's right. It is... Bitcoin price, and as you can see, over the last couple of years, it's gone through some interesting times. If you read The Economist a couple of weeks ago, The Economist stated, Bitcoin has failed in its stated objective to become a usable currency. Interesting. How do many folks here actually think that way? Well, the key is for us to understand how this all began before we can really speculate on what Bitcoin or, their, or some of the other cryptocurrencies may do. So why don't we go back to the beginning. In 2018, during the financial crisis, Satoshi proposed Bitcoin as an electronic payment system independent of any central authority that could be transferred electronically in a secure and immutable way. Similar to the philosophy of Satoshi himself, herself, the key aspects and characteristics of this currency are around being anonymous, decentralized, mutable, and with an underlying incentive mechanism. We'll run through an example shortly, but today Bitcoin can be used to pay for goods and services online, challenging existing payment providers such as PayPal. So when folks or publications say that Bitcoin's a failure, I want to remind that Bitcoin's current value is over $110 billion. That is potentially bigger than the largest bank in Canada, which has been around for over a century. So before we start judging the applications or the impact of this currency, let's talk a little bit about how this actually works. So I want to walk you through an example today. Let's say you want to send money overseas. Traditionally, you would go to a bank, or use a PayPal-like service, which can take hours, days, and cost you a transaction fee. But with, that, with Bitcoin, ideally, you don't have to deal with that nonsense. Um, the reason being, when you start sending money via a Bitcoin wallet, your identity is, first of all, anonymous. Uh, rather than using your name or an account information, you're using a computer code. That transaction is then proposed on a distributed network of machines. So a bank today would use a payments network. In the Bitcoin world, it's distributed network of machines. It could be all your phones connected in this room today. The underlying innovation as part of the blockchain ecosystem is the incentive mechanism. And hence, when a transaction is announced in the network, there are these machines, or called miners, that are fighting to solve mathematical problems to verify and validate your transaction. So if Alice and Bob are transacting, Alice has sent, let's say, one Bitcoin, the machines will compute and validate that transaction. The reason being these miners have to be incentivized in order to keep this system operating globally, right? What this means is once the winning computation is realized, the transaction is then written in a block, which becomes a part of a chain. So simple to say, this transaction happens within minutes and at pretty much zero cost in an ideal scenario. So 
this can open up a lot of use cases on the payment side. So think about micropayments, microtransactions. Um, today, it is unfeasible to send fraction of dollars if you want to, let's say, pay for one article online rather than just a full subscription service. You can't do that because it's too expensive. The infrastructure is too expensive to make that happen. But with a mechanism like this, you can send cents of a dollar in order to pay for a transaction. Imagine the possibilities with microfinance in developing countries. It is this underlying infrastructure which is revolutionary. While the prices of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies will go up and down, the focus we want to have is on the underlying technology. So let's get into it. Please take a moment to absorb this. At its core, blockchain is a next generation global database, which can record and track anything of value. Could be money, could be data. You've probably used Excel or Google Docs, which are databases. Uh, you've probably also seen how Wikipedia works. So let's say this room here is community of Wikipedia, um, and you're able to edit what's happening in Wikipedia. The way it would work is, if Steven, sitting here right in front of me, makes an edit, it goes to Wikipedia for a verification. However, there's still a central organization that makes those decisions. In the blockchain world, any of you could edit Wikipedia, but instead of a central organization verifying that change, it will be the majority of this community right here in front of us with your machines connected validating that change in an instantaneous manner. And that's what makes this technology very exciting. Because of this consensus-driven mechanism and the underlying incentive mechanism, no party controls what this network could do. Blockchain is fully public. We don't need intermediaries such as banks or worry about Facebook and Google manipulating data because, frankly, on blockchain, the entire network will see what their algorithms are doing, and I'm sure they don't want the network to see what's happening. When we start to apply this methodology to applications beyond money transfer, you start to open up a completely different world. Here are some examples I'd like to walk you through today. Let's think about public sector. Governments can't rig elections anymore because every vote is written on the blockchain network, verified by the community, and cannot be changed or edited. In energy sector, micropayments can track and optimize consumption. You can pay by use. In healthcare, medical data can be encrypted and stored on blocks of data that can be shared across different providers. In education, as an example, credentials such as degrees and transcripts can be validated and instantaneously and enabling instant verification of the technology and the knowledge of that individual or, or that party. Transportation, full transparency into full supply chain. It's not just for transportation, it also applies to the film industry. The possibilities are endless. So how do we move forward? How do we build these applications? Well, thanks to ambitious projects such as Ethereum, community around the world, of developer community around the world are building some exciting applications using blockchain technology. And I must say, Ethereum was founded right here in Canada with folks such as Vitalik and Joe Lovin and Anthony Delorio, you know, thanks to them and the community around Ethereum that is taking blockchain applications to the next generation. So what is Ethereum? Ethereum is a world computer that aims to decentralized internet applications. What does that really mean? Well, at core, Ethereum uses blockchain's design, but it enables application development. So think of iOS as an example today. A lot of developers use iOS to build mobile apps. 
Similarly, in the blockchain sector, you could use Ethereum to build applications in order to deliver goods or services, or frankly, provide applications that could be in sectors that are applicable to media or social or government as we talked about. The key innovation as part of Ethereum network is the concept of smart contracts. So if you have been involved in any sort of legal contracts in the past, imagine creating a computer programmable contract that is executed based on certain parameters and is essentially unstoppable once you've implemented on the computer network, what we call the world network of Ethereum. What's really interesting is applications using Ethereum provide data control to its owners and creative rights to its authors. And these apps are run on a network which is global. This is the global Ethereum network. There are over 15,000 machines across six continents that are running the Ethereum blockchain network, making it the most decentralized network globally. Now, there have been discussions around how certain countries uh, may have more machines running in certain jurisdictions, but as you can see, irrespective of that, just the sheer adoption of developers and technologists around the world makes this a really exciting development in technology. But can we build any application using Ethereum? I often ask startups that I look for investments in this specific questions. This is from the founder of Ethereum. Can you please tell me why using Ethereum blockchain is better than using Excel? This is an important question. So when you go out in the market and are looking to build applications for your specific industry, this is a question you should ask your potential partners, developers, and even yourself. Why not just use Excel? Why not just use Salesforce or Amazon? Why do you want to use blockchain? Answering this question is very important before you begin your journey of building applications in the blockchain sector. Let's walk through an example. Oops, how do I go back? There we go. So let's buy a house in Ethereum. Top half of the slide. Today, traditionally, when you want to go buy a, a house, you would go find the property via broker, you would then find financing, you would then get lawyers, and then eventually work through the municipality to make sure you have the ownership right of that property. This process, as many of you can know, can take a lot of time and effort and money. If this was to done in a computer progra programmatic way using smart contracts, it's bottom half of the slide, the computer program that you rigged in a smart contract is the code of law. There are no intermediaries. If you define the value of your property as X dollars and you write the contract, your ownership is written right to the blockchain. And the whole network knows that you own that property. There is no second guessing. This is an interesting development and use case because if you think about developing countries, a lot of them are testing blockchain-powered land registries to make details of real estate agents and transactions visible to everyone. This is interesting because a high percentage of fraud happens in developing countries around real estate because of unregistered land. So it's very interesting how countries like Sweden or even some countries in South America are testing land registry as a use case uh, to, to solve this issue. What's, what's exciting is the progress of Ethereum and some of the other blockchain platforms are incubating a decentralized world. What that really means is today an emerging group of startups are reimagining existing internet infrastructure using blockchain technologies, leveraging the distributed power of the blockchain network. These companies are developing products and services intended to unbundle or eliminate many of the centralized applications that customers, that consumers and businesses use today. So on your left, you'll see how we see the world today. This is the internet world of today. It's funny, to a certain extent, you know, the tech community is, is 
somewhat a victim of its own success because a lot of startups that I speak with today are looking to move away from these centralized platforms such as Facebook and Google. Every layer of the infrastructure starting from the top, applications, the underlying protocols that govern the rules of the internet, and the infrastructure, such as computer servers, every single layer is getting disrupted by companies that are building products and services using blockchain technology. So in the future, you may see a Google in the blockchain world that does not track your data, that has no idea where you are and what part of the world you are. All it knows is you're searching for something. From a protocol layer, you can build stores online without help of any intermediary. Today, if you were to open up an online store, you would use a service like Shopify, as an example. Big fan, by the way, Canadian company. But in 10, 20 years, you may be able to do that yourself without any intermediary. And what's even more interesting is when you start to think about the computer infrastructure, the cloud computing infrastructure in the world today, a lot of that won't exist in decades to come. This is one example of a decentralized application powered by smart contracts. Makes them really unstoppable. No intermediaries, fully autonomous. Open Bazaar. It's not a website. It's not a company. It's not an organization. No one actually controls Open Bazaar other than its community. Users download the application and then they would transact with each other. They will sell goods and services for cryptocurrencies in return. Why should you pay eBay 10% when you can use this? Now, there are a lot of challenges, and we're going to talk about them in a second. But this is unbelievable. This changes everything when it comes to online commerce. So where are we in the evolution? We started with Bitcoin in 2008. A lot of companies in that phase were focused on cryptocurrencies. It was the new innovation that everyone was talking about. They still do. They're important. They're core to the infrastructure. Then we moved on to realizing the power of blockchain and smart contracts. That's when Ethereum, Ripple, Consensus, all these companies emerged. Today, we're in the middle of the revolution of decentralized applications. How many folks here have heard of CryptoKitties, by the way? Excellent. I was sitting in a panel, uh, I was listening to a panel yesterday here. I was talking about how one of the kitty was sold for over $100,000. That's amazing, but to me, that's not the key takeaway. To me, the key takeaway is a game like CryptoKitties was able to build an on-ramp for average consumers to blockchain network. It is the underlying infrastructure which is powerful. Imagine, forget kitties, imagine all the brands you work with in your industry. What if you could create something like that using CryptoKitties infrastructure? That is truly innovative. So as we start to look forward, we should expect to see a lot of applications that are going to leverage and utilize the power of decentralized network. And that's what makes this whole conversation exciting. So, I want to end with some key challenges before I invite Stephen for a conversation. I will say that we are still in very early stages of the development of this technology. There are challenges around customer adoption. There are challenges around user experience. People are used to some really good application user experience. And until that's resolved, it will be challenging for blockchain applications to see adoption. Scalability and performance are still challenging because it's, although the, the network is distributed and it's global, it's consensus-based, and hence it will require more and more developers and systems to become part of the network to grow over time. Energy consumption, for those of you that have been following what's happening in the crypto mining world, energy consumption is a it's an important factor. A lot of the governments are trying to regulate how mining operations in Asia are consuming energy because you're running essentially machines which take power. And finally, the hype around cryptocurrencies. 
But I think we're still, like I said, in the early stages of this technology. These, a lot of these challenges will get resolved over time. Just think about the first website you use or think about the first smartphone you used and, and think about where it is today. Technology goes through cycles and eventually it comes to a stage when it's ready for mainstream. So I want to thank you for your time today and I would like to invite Stephen to come up to stage and, and we'll have a conversation. They're giving me a cup with uh, water. I, I brought a spiked coffee up here, so <laughs> keep it interesting. Good. I, may, I may have to get some of, some of that from you later. Yeah, we'll put it in the middle. <laughs> well, Stephen, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. Um, with pleasure. You know, we've, we've talked about this topic in the past and a little bit this morning. Um, we'll love to start learning a little bit more about your experience, uh, and if you could please elaborate how you got involved in the blockchain sector and why. Sure. Uh, 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 as uh, uh, Karina kindly said, uh, I've had a kind of rangy career through a series of happy accidents that have uh, uh, taken me, uh, I think in the blockchain world you'd call it forked, uh, various times. Uh, started that as a human rights lawyer, ended up doing a documentary that got uh, an award. Uh, I thought, well, that's fun. Nobody, you know, I got to go up on stage and sort of wave to mom and thought, well, this is kind of something I don't get to do as a lawyer sitting alone in a room. So I moved into the movie business. It turned out it was welcoming. I got a bunch of movies made. Um, that led to um, working on films that had a strong digital infrastructure of uh, special effects and animation and so forth. I became fascinated uh, and began as somebody who was never a math major, but nevertheless tried to understand what went into making a, 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 a sort of digital experience. Uh, I'm, a good, I'm a decent storyteller, so I tried to figure out how do I take my sort of uh, slight ability to understand the digital aspects of filmmaking, tie it to uh, my enormous appreciation for good storytelling, and figure out how to merge that into becoming a content guy who understood just enough of the digital world to function in it. Um, I went to AOL at that point. AOL uh, was the internet. We're going back now to 2000. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you remember that, but there was a point at which AOL put a billion disks out into the world which you could stick into your computer and suddenly you heard this crackle, crackle, crackle and you're online and you're talking to people. And there were millions of people doing it. And there was these tiny companies called Yahoo and Microsoft, a big company, but a small online presence. And I got to play in the content plus digital world, um, went to a bunch of startups. And at that point, the internet, is, as uh, Prashant was saying, the sort of 1.0 became the 2.0. And What's interesting for me, because I've been in the sort of strat space, is nobody wants to talk about, you know, what did you used to do? They want to talk about what are my, you know, how do you help me solve my problems for tomorrow? And at that point now, we're in the 2013 range, there were a series of questions that started coming up, the solutions for which seemed to lead to blockchain. And I became aware of it maybe in about 2015, began playing with it in various small ways while I was still at, uh, in my next job, which was at Time Inc. And when I left Time Inc. in 2017, I went full-time into the blockchain space. That's great. And, and what are some of the projects you're excited about um, that you see in the market today? Well, what I'm excited about is the future state. It's the future that creates the, the, the present in this, in this field, I think. There, there's a very robust present um, that your, this audience, these chairs here, have been filled for a day and a half, largely filled with people who are trying to figure out, can I use coins to fund my movie? 
And uh, if, 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 if uh, TIFF said, we're going to have a blockchain conversation that didn't include how do I fund my movie, 90% of the folks who've been here until today's panel wouldn't have shown up. That was entirely the focus, I think, of the folks who came. You, you guys, are here because I think we're, we're going to talk about the future state of motion pictures, which is a lot more interesting when you integrate blockchain than just how do you fund the movie? Um, and because it is, it has, it can entirely change the way this process is done from the writer sitting at his or her desk to the consumer who sees the final product and uh, all, everywhere in between. And, and w if in the 27 minutes and 19, 18, 17 seconds we have left, I'd like to sort of work with Prashant and you guys to help think through how blockchain can create the future state of films because there are an enormous number of ways in which it can relate and we'll get into that, I guess. Yeah, so why don't we jump right in? Uh, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about different use cases you think that are applicable sure. to, the, to the film industries and We'd we'll love to obviously engage the audience as we, as we talk about this. Uh, very much. Um, and, and first of all, uh, if you will indulge me, um, how many of you, well, probably all of you, um, we remember those photos of Leonardo da Vinci's drawings of what the future might look like, the future of flight, the future of this and that, or Buckminster Fuller. This was 2.30 a.m. this morning. This is the future state of the motion picture industry. It's not nearly as pretty as Leonardo's stuff. But, um, but, I, but I, I think I've tr what I've tried to do is think through um, from that in individual moment of creation of a film idea to that individual moment of looking at a screen, what are all the stages and how could blockchain make them um, improve and have implications for making all aspects um, better than they are today? Um, so let's, we're going to create a screenwriter. We're going to call her Tatiana. I picked Tatiana because the first musician who put out uh, uh, an album on the blockchain was uh, Tatiana Moroz. So we're going to, so we have a screenwriter sitting alone in her room named mm -hmm. Tatiana. And um, Tatiana has written a story about um, st starting a new uh, venture fund um, um, and a central character called Prashant. And uh, the first thing Tatiana's got to do is protect that story. So she puts it on a he, she puts it on a blockchain, and that blockchain becomes an immutable record of her having come up with the Prashant v new VC fund in Toronto story. So, and, and why is that important? That's important because we live in an industry, we function in an industry in which there's an enormous amount of fudging of who owns what, who came up with this idea. There are still lawsuits over who came up with Return of the Jedi. I mean, it's, these, are, these are endless debates over trying to uh, grab, uh, uh, grab credit for the work of the most important people in this entire process who are the creators. So Tatiana, by virtue of putting her story on the blockchain, now has an immutable record that she was the person who invented this storyline throughout this whole process. So and if I'm going to refer to this, this is like the 2.30 in the morning drawing. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking as I'm Imag remembering how it, this all got sketched out. So remember the first to, thing this person Remember to does, frame that later. I, yes, we're going <laughs> to uh, we take, we'll take pictures later. I'll take, I'll sign them later. We're going to give them out. Um, so the, so Tatiana, if she's lucky enough, because she's, she's Ivan, she's Ivan Reitman's uh, niece. So she actually has an agent, which is helpful. Uh, uh, so Tatiana has an agent and Tatiana is going to send her piece out to her agent. Now, um, there's a lot of agents in town, and agents are all trying to hustle stuff, but she only wants to give it to her agent. So she, while she operates in what we would call this sort of permissionless world where every creator can get on that blockchain that registers material, she's now operating in a permissioned world where only her agent can see that piece of material that's sent. And um, uh, again, that's important to protect her idea. So she sent it to her agent. Um, 
what happens in Hollywood at that point when there's a good idea floating around is agents start sending it to other agents. The agent's assistant gives it to a friend of his who works at a movie company. All that stuff, you know, right, happened to you. So I love that. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up, <laughs> promise you. I've, I've been to 90210 more than once. Um, and so the agents start sending it around to the studios and to their friends. Now, in, in this immutable ledger world, every time somebody starts sharing this, there is now a record that Tatiana invented the Prashant story that, you, I love it. Yeah, exactly. It will change things. That's the f we're now at only layer number one. We've already made progress in the, in the industry. Secondly, so then the agent starts sending it out to only the places that um, the, the client, uh, in this case Tatiana, wants it sent. Why might she have uh, inclinations about uh, where she wants it sent? Well, uh, pardon me for saying it, let's just say there's a moment in time where she may not want to do business with the late Weinstein Company. So she just says, I don't want it to go to the Weinstein Company for any number of reasons. Uh, um, so. Uh, or um, I'm a vegan, I don't want it to go to M McDonald's Productions. So Tatiana creates this list of where it can go. And again, we are, the artist, the creator, remains in control of the process as it now goes out to the studios, only to the places that she wants it to go. And eventually we now arrive at this next stage which is the individual producer who gets it. Um, the individual producer who gets it ha now has the job of taking it to a studio to finance the project. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever waited for your agent to call you back. Um, in this transparent universe, Tatiana doesn't have to wait for her agent to call her back or for the producer to call her back. Tatiana knows where this pro where the script is, um, what the producer is doing with it, who the producer sent it to, until you get to a point at which one of the studios to which it was sent now wants to finance the movie. And Tatiana's deal says, if this movie costs more than $11,100,000, uh, she gets a bigger fee. Well. In the old system, she's got to depend on some agent to tell her you know, what kind of a deal did I make and did it, did it include the above the line fees or the below the line fees, did it include the interest on the interest on the interest in that number and eventually in the complicated accounting which is Hollywood, she would have had no way of knowing how much money actually went into making that movie and does she deserve her bonus. So now in the transparent universe, Tatiana is going to know if that if the bonus is due, but most importantly, we are now dealing in an entirely different blockchain. We're dealing in a world of multiple blockchains. So now the production studio itself has a blockchain because the production studio is going to spend eleven million dollars on a crew of a hundred people, each of whom has certain KPIs that they have to deliver to the movie. They have to deliver it on time. They're, we're moving a lot of stuff around. We're moving a lot of trucks around. We're moving cameras in boxes, and all of which may now have uh, IoT sensors connected to them, so we actually know when they left the studio, when they arrive, and for the purposes of actually making the movie, putting, creating this whole separate blockchain just for the production, becomes its own um, fabulous use of this technology for just simply the simplicity of being able at any given moment in real time to see how your movie's doing and how that money's being spent. Then the movie's done, we gotta go to a distribution mechanism. Let's just say the distribution mechanism can either be theatrical or, or, uh, or streamed, domestic or international. In each of those cases, you have um, permission, you have contracts which will define who has the right to show it. It's windowed, so certain people have the right to show it only two, you know, two weeks after it's out of the theaters or five weeks after it's out of the theaters. 
in all of Germany, there's only one company that actually has the theatrical rights and one or two other companies that might have the so-called cable rights or the streaming rights. Now, I promise you, in a world where movies get copied, files get shared peer-to-peer, -peer, there is a tremendous amount of piracy in the world. We all know that. And any of us who are in the creative, like my friend sitting over here, who uh, uh, clearly is a creator, um, anybody in the creative world knows that piracy steals your money. Um, you want to stop that. So you are tremendously incentivized by this phenomenon of the blockchain and this movement of transparency to move to this new universe in which every player in a permissioned blockchain, um, on, a perm on, a, on a blockchain which is permissioned in various layers, um, can make sure that the person who paid the money to get the rights in Germany is the only person who is putting it in theaters. It's not, go, you know, his or her son and secretary haven't copied it and it's now out to everybody and no one buys tickets. Um, the, if it's a streaming service, then we know who has paid that uh, VOD fee. We actually know how much the VOD fee was. And let me come back to who for just a second, because the who who paid it is now somebody in a town, and we're making it up Germany, someone in a town in Germany who likes Tatiana's stuff. So what does that mean? That means that the next time Tatiana has a project, I'm going to be looking at Tatiana's project knowing that there's this universe of individuals out there. I know, how to, I know who they are. I know how to find them. I know how much they're willing to pay for Tatiana's type of storytelling. And this then drives Tatiana's career to whole new heights because there is this audience out there and we know who they are and we know how to talk to them who can now become a driver for Tatiana as she grows her career. So we've now, we've looked at the distribution piece, we've looked at the consumer piece. What are some of the implications of this world? I I'll give you one. We're, um, what, uh, the ultimate movie, like the, 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 the golden chalice we all seek in the movie business is um, big movie stars working for very, big movie stars because that's what gets people to the movies to, to a great degree, working for very low fees so that your movie is affordable to make. An interesting movie is affordable to make. Everything doesn't have to be popcorn and comic books. Um, how do you do that? Well, one of the reasons movies cost so much is because those actors don't think they're going to get paid on the back end, so they take all their money on the front end. Now, in this new blockchain universe, where the actors and the agents have a trusted layer of, of, uh, of now information about the flow of money, this now means that I think you're going to see the price of movies come down, more interesting movies than just comic book movies getting made because the actors who help bring people into theaters um, are, are now working for less money. You have a side chain to make sure, you have a side chain for the auditing of those movies because all the records are public and the auditing could take like just a week instead of nine months. You have a side chain for maybe the music, so BMI and, and CSAC can make sure that the other brilliant creator who sat at a keyboard, we're in the Glenn Gould Studios, somebody, some, you know, today's young Glenn Gould, the movie score, uh, writer is um, is now going to get that money from CSAC because every time that movie got played anywhere, it lives on the chain. And the the union people. My dad worked in a factory. I'm a big fan of unions. Um, the um, his his last fund, Prashant's last fund, was all funded by unions. Um, we love unions. So union guys, and I've worked with truckers and I've worked with gaffers, I've worked with just some of the most wonderful women and men in, in this industry, they don't get much money for these movies that make five, six hundred million dollars. But suddenly in a world where everybody who works on the film can get some kind of residuals, we now have a universe in which micropayments begin to add up and everybody involved in the process can now become rewarded for being in this industry we get, we're privileged to be a part of. So that was 2.30 this morning, just thinking about 
all of the implications of what this technology can bring in both the cycle of, 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 of virtuous results and the efficiency and transparency in this new proof of trust, a world that doesn't get used a lot in movie terms, a uh, new proof of trust universe and movement we're a part of. And that's a great example, and mm -hmm. I really hope that story is told one day. But it's you've, on, it's you've, on painted, video. you've painted. <laughs> I owned it. You've painted a picture mm -hmm. where you've got all these stakeholders from different part of the value chain in the film industry are involved. How do we get them there? What, 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 what do you think are the key barriers and challenges for the film industry today to start to adopt or test something like this you're talking about? I think you answered the question. Um, you showed the progress of the internet technology from the very first um, early DARPA funded probably stuff that went on in and around the internet to today and how long it took. Mm -hmm. Seven years, give or take, and look where we are. Less than seven years, because really from, to me, what I'm describing is built on Ethereum. It's built on the smart contracts. It's built on that blockchain, not the crypto thing. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, uh, so really, it's been more like four years or less to get here, where we're having this conversation. So... What does it take? It, it just takes a little more time. It takes, it takes the, the movie business is like the elephants in the circus. Um, you know, the, the trunk of one is tied to the tail of the other. And every time something works, like a comic book movie, or we just went through it, right? Uh, Black Panther. Nobody ever thought of a kind of black comic book character having his own movie, her own movie in this case. And um, um, now that there's been one, there'll been, there'll be 50. So that's how the industry works. For one success leads everybody to want to follow. Uh, I believe the first success we have in the uh, DRM space in music, the first success we have in a movie that gets financed and streamed, where all of the dollars are transparent, um, as those stories get told, mm -hmm. the movement builds. And I can see already this movement is building very quickly. Very fascinating, love the, love the example. Let's open up some questions from the audience, please. Yes, please. Okay, so that's a lovely story. I would buy it if it were in a book. I would see it if it were on a screen. Today's world, the world that I've been experiencing, I'm a writer, much like Tatiana. I don't have the fan base that you have. And your uncle's not Ivan Reitman. He is not, <laughs> as far as I know. That would be a lovely world, and I would love to live in that space. My experience as a writer and a producer um, is such that production companies would have to kind of have a diametric change, a shift in their paradigm mm -hmm. in order to identify with the idea that you've just shared with us. That would be great. So when you ask the question, what is it going to take, my thought is it's going to take a production company that's willing to expose themselves to such a level of transparency. They are adverse in my experience. They what do you say about that? Uh, uh, I will say they exist. They're still small. They're, they haven't yet produced their first hit, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Joe Lubin of Ethereum fame helped fund uh, Braid, which was a movie made using blockchain. There's several others that have been done by companies like Big Couch and uh, um, uh, Singular. Um, so they exist. We're a hit-driven business. I promise you the first time one of those becomes a hit, mm -hmm. three companies will become 20 companies. Um, this audience, if we were here to talk about let's fund your movie with blockchain three years ago, would have had two people in it. This was, I mean, we're, we're, here to, we're here being intellectuals this afternoon. We're thinking about a decentralized future. Look at the topic. We're not here. The word money is not in there. If the word money were there, this place would be packed because yesterday's panels about money and Bitcoin were all packed. Um, so I think the first time something produces money, then I think everybody will flock to it. We're just not there yet, but it's coming. Uh, and I'm... You know, I've been a net profit participant in studio movies. I've seen this thing from the ass end. 
you know, and I know, and, and I started as like a human rights lawyer, documentary producer, it, with a father who was a factory worker, no trust funds, you know. I started where you are, um, except without your ability to write. I, I was, you know, I produce because I can't sing, dance, write, or do like anything really gifted. Um, so um, it's coming. If I believe it, um, I share it with you as something that you should see and, and imagine is possible. Other questions? Please. Um, so this decentralized future has a great opportunity for anonymity. Um, but it also has a great opportunity to, like you said, drill down to this person who likes Tatiana's film in Germany, assuming they're not trying to be anonymous. Um, when you go to Ikea and they ask your postal code, everyone thinks, oh no, I don't want spam, but it's really just useful information so they can figure out where to put their next Ikea. How do we tell people in this decentralized future that your privacy is valuable, but the amount of information we can get from you to give you what you want and what, you, what you're looking for, how do we strike that balance between anonymity and drilling down to the perfect fan for a filmmaker? Well, a, a, assuming a perfect world for a filmmaker is a world where that anonymity disappears and we can, um, we can talk to our audiences, then um, I think you're talking about a value exchange. The value exchange at the Walmart is um, uh, uh, I'm afraid to give you my information because I don't want to be spammed, but uh, in the, uh, um, uh, uh, trying to rhyme with spam, Pam, Pam, that stuff that you spray on the, uh, on the <laughs> grill, you know. But I want my Pam, right? So if you kind of want your, Pam, and you want the discount on the Pam, they're going to say, you sure you don't want to give me your name? Don't you want that 20 cent discount like every week when you buy your Pam? And in this world of the value exchanges, I do think we're going to end up um, still sharing a great deal of information. And in our space, let's get away from the uh, cooking oils. Um, the, in our space, it's if you want to see Tatiana's next film, if you really thought this was neat, you know, if Tatiana made a really cool doc like on Ruth Ginsburg, um, an American icon these days, thank God, and um, the, uh, then I'd say, yeah, I'm kind of willing to give my privacy. But remember, um, anonymity suggests this uh, uh, permissionless blockchain that's entirely open. Um, transparent doesn't mean open to everybody all the time. So it could be that you give up your information in order to get Tatiana's next movie. I didn't give it up in order to get the next crappy movie. Right. And I, I think from a technology perspective, there are ways where you could encrypt you know, the data you share. Um, so there are a whole bunch of startups today that are working on concepts and products or platforms where if you submit a certain piece of data on the blockchain network, it gets encrypted and it only gets unlocked by the other party if they have the key, a private key that you need to unlock that data, and it's fully anonymized. And that's unbelievable because if you think about another technology, which, which I had in one of my slides, artificial intelligence needs a lot of data. However, most startups don't have that data. So when you bring these two concepts together, you can, you can imagine a world where a software is learning everything it needs to learn from a data set which is completely anonymized and encrypt it, but yet you can share that data and, and protect privacy. We've uh, got time for a couple more questions. Yep, four minutes in eight, seven, six seconds. Uh, um, I think you're about I, to get the mic. Thank you. Over thank your you. right Hello, shoulder. Um, I don't disagree with anything you said about the vision for the future and thank the God. opportunity for creative, creatives to get paid. But if you look um, out from here, out to the West Coast and Hollywood, um, they've always controlled the industry from the top end. Mm -hmm. And the primary weapon has been finance. And if you look at the value of the crypto markets and the potential that has to bring, you know, I don't know how much money, but a certain amount of money in from those type of markets in this industry, 
That's going to take away a big lever of control from Hollywood, and surely there is going to be a massive backlash against that, both in terms of the control piece, but also the disruption to this, um, the, the, as you described it, the elephants following each other's tail um, method. You know, how, how, how do you follow the next elephant if you don't quite know where it's going? I'd say that the control was partly finance and partly distribution. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, Hollywood had power to control distribution, you wouldn't be dealing in the world you have today of over-the-top streaming and so forth. So even the most powerful institutions, it seems, are being disrupted. It's Chris Christensen, Harvard Business School. If you don't disrupt your company, someone's going to do it for you. Uh, I think they're beginning to get that. So if I'm uh, uh, today, if I'm a public company, and I'm got my head in the sand and like it, um, uh, I'm not going to be a public company, a successful public company, very long. Because if if the street doesn't see me, mm -hmm. if if in if the investor community doesn't see me beginning to uh, vibrate with like the new stuff that's coming down then my stock's going to tank, I'm going to be out as the CEO, and the number one job of every executive in the world is not to get fired. So I'm going to be seen as a not innovative, not uh, executive who's not exploring the future. So I think uh, you are, uh, for all of, uh, and I entirely agree that, I less agree that the money controls the process today um, than because the fact is the studios don't even finance most of the movies of these days that they're distributing themselves. So it's, it's, a, it's a little less the old studio system where there were six companies who had all the money who, do you know, to this day, I mentioned Revenge of the Jedi. Revenge of the Jedi is not profitable to this day. Dark Knight is not profitable to this day. The Hobbit movies are not profitable to this day. So to your point, yeah, they've been lousy, they've been nasty masters. But I do think they're, as public companies and as folks in a world that's changing from 2.0 to 3.0, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those companies to uh, adapt. Stephen, it's been a pleasure having you. Prashant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Folks, thanks for your questions. Appreciate your day. Thank you. We did it. Great conversation.